Good evening, Sports Zonians. How's everybody doing out there tonight? I am Mike Aguilaro. I am your host for this is Sports Zone. Coming to you live like we usually do here via the I-95 Sports and Entertainment Radio Network, which I guess is now officially Blackjack TV. So I do want to give a shout out to Bobby Guarante, the president and head of what I guess was formerly I-95 Sports and Entertainment Radio Network and is now Blackjack TV, which of course debuted on uh, Zingo TV uh, a few weeks ago, and we were the first show on there, so uh, I do consider that a pretty big honor there, so thank you to Bobby for everything you do, and we got a good show for you tonight here. We're hoping to have Dave Hastings maybe more towards the end of the program. We'll be joined by Eric Tressler in a few minutes here, and we got a lot to talk about tonight, but I am going to start off, you know, this is this is my life, folks. This is, this is the way my life usually goes, uh, besides the fact that the Mets suck and of course we will get to everything that has gone on with the Mets over the last few days momentarily here so I mentioned last week I had a busy weekend ahead of me I work at a party city in Mount Kisco New York and it's June so it's graduation weekend I'm working five straight days horrible five straight days Uh, a lot of stuff so uh, Monday was my last day and then I get three days off so I'm off today tomorrow Wednesday and it's nice. I worked all week for these three days off, and then this morning, kidney stones. Now, this is the third, fourth time in my life I've had kidney stones, but to have it start off the morning of three days off after five brutal work days. I was in pain all morning, went to the emergency room, got out about noon. So just to, to have that happen is just so typical of the way my life goes. Uh, I must have done something horrible, horribly wrong in a past life, to tell you the truth, with the way things go for me. But <coughs> I am here. I have made it. I am pain-free at the moment. So I have all that going for me right now. And we're going to have a good show here tonight. And what I'd like to do to start off the show is, yes, uh, so you had the NBA draft last week. You had the NHL draft on Friday. Um uh, Devils uh, took who they were going to take at number one, Jack, something or other. I can get I can get uh, Tressler to fill me in on that when he comes in. Capo Caco, I believe is the guy's name, who goes number two to the Rangers, which is basically what everybody thought was going to wind up happening. It sounds like these two guys are going to be building blocks for both franchises moving forward, so good on them. Devils apparently made a really good trade towards the end of the draft, getting P.K. Supon, which I just heard about a couple of days ago, so good on them. Uh, Knicks take R.J. Barrett with the three pick, which we all kind of knew was going to happen. They didn't do anything cute. They just took their guy at three, so good on them. Pelicans made some waves with, uh, of course, the Anthony Davis trade, which we talked about last week, and then they traded down from four with the Atlanta Hawks, so they wound up with about three or four young guys coming out of this uh, uh, draft to go along with what they get. Um, from the Lakers, uh, so you know, Alonzo Ball, Brandon Ingram, Josh Hart, then he had three young prospects to go with uh, Drew Holiday on the team. And I know there's a couple of the players that they're still going to have next season. I just, I, I'm not going to look up their names right now. But uh, I agree with what Eric said last week and what we have decided to dub the hot garbage episode that um, they're probably going to be um, – 15 20 win team but when you look at what they got with the young nucleus this is the trade-off that certain teams have to make in the NBA do you go after the star names or do you try to build around young players and with the Pelicans they trade away the big star now you got a nice little crop of all these young players and it's up to them to develop them and you still got all the assets and the future draft picks and everything from that trade so we're going to see if they'll be able to do it. And this is where we're actually really going to be able to see what Alvin Gentry can do as a, as a head coach. And we're going to see what David Griffin can do as a general manager. Cause in my opinion, nobody really looks at him as a respected general manager. 
because he was with the Cavaliers for so long and, you know, and uh, LeBron James and everything. And everybody always kind of looked at LeBron James as the general manager and David Griffin just holding the title. Over the next few years, we're going to be able to see what he actually is as a general manager. So good on him for that. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but let's let's get into some Met talk right now. Uh, as I said, Eric should be on the show in a few minutes here. But, uh, yeah, so the Mets season, for all intents and purposes, is going down the tubes. Uh, they started tonight's action five games under 500. Um, they had a pretty poor week last week. They played the Cubs over the weekend. They actually won Friday and Saturday. Then they go into Sunday. Um, Callaway leaves Lugo in a little bit too long, didn't have his best stuff, didn't go to Edwin Diaz. As, uh, they blow the game because that's what the Mets bullpen does is they blow games. Uh, and then at the press conference after the fact, and hi, Mom, I see my mom in the chat room. Um, after, in the press conference after the fact, he starts cursing out a reporter. And Jason Vargas, Jason Vargas of all people, the guy who absolutely no Met fan would care if they just cut his ass tomorrow. Nobody would care at all. Nobody would bat an eye. This is the guy who makes the big scene, defending his manager, which I kind of respect that you're going to defend the manager because the manager, for all, for all intents and purposes, he's stuck by Vargas where I think on any other team, Vargas probably would have been out the door a long time ago. So the manager has stuck by him. Vargas makes a big scene, stares down the reporter, has to be held back by a couple players. I think it was Seth Lugo and Noah Syndergaard. I'm not sure about it. So it's this whole big melee thing um, after, after the game. And it's just like, okay, so your bullpen's a joke. You actually have a good lineup, but it's, it's completely um, – weighted down by the fact that you have this albatross by the name of Robinson Cano, who you have to play every day, even though he's done nothing this season. Dude done hustle at all, which we've always known, but you knew what you were going to get. You knew what the downside to Cano was going to be when you traded for him. So you have him. You are stuck with him for the next five years, and he's holding back this great young lineup with guys like Jeff McNeil who can't play every day because, God forbid, you actually try to play him five or six days. The only guy who's really hitting over 300, let's not play him every day. You, you, you uh, can't play Conforto six or seven days in a row for some reason because both McNeil and Conforto were out of lineup on Sunday. You actually got some young talent, as I say, guys like Dominic Smith and J.D. Davis who can't play every day either because why would you play them every day? Bullpen's a joke. Starting pitching has been inconsistent is the nicest thing you can say about that starting pitching right now. When you got guys like DeGrom and Syndergaard and Mats and Wheeler, you were relying on all of them. Not one of them has been exactly what you thought you were going to get out of them for the whole season. You got all these things going wrong. For some reason, you are still kind of sort of in a... For some reason... And this defies description, but you are still kind of sort of it. Hang on a second here. Uh, seven five seven six three four eight. Okay, but for some reason, you are still uh, in a, some sort of a playoff hunt here because you're really only three and a half games out of a wild card, so you're still in it. But you got everything going wrong because everyone you brought in for the bullpen has either been terrible or is hurt. And now you want to add to matters with this whole Callaway fiasco. And everything that happened yesterday didn't exactly help anything because then you got reports coming out that, and this makes all the sense in the world, that Brody Van Wagenen, the general manager, is actually the one making the decisions and is delegating in-game moves to Mickey Calloway, sending him messages through guys who work in the clubhouse uh, to take the Grom out after six innings on June 1st when he's battling a hip or something, something that the Grom was very upset about, or make changes, or he's the one who won't let McNeil play every day, even though God knows he needs to play every day because he's him and Alonzo 
probably the best parts of that Met lineup right now. And if you actually let your young guys play every day, you have a respectable lineup. They don't want to do that because, for some, because you know, Brody Van Wagenen, I don't know what Cano has on Brody Van Wagenen. He's got some pictures of him doing something. He's got to stay in the lineup every day. He's only hitting two twenty four. He's having the worst season of his career because that's what all-star second basemen do when they come to the New York Mets is they completely shit the bed and forget how to do everything they did in their career. You look at history. Robbie Alomar, Carlos Baerga, Juan Samuel in 1987. Every one of these guys, all-star second basemen, they get to the Mets, they forgot how to play. They don't know how to play. They don't know what's going on. Ed Cano to that list now. Which was one of the risks when you traded for this guy. And that's why everybody was up in arms about trading away the prospects when you traded for him in December. And it was one of the risks you knew you were going to have to deal with. Because this is the Mets, everything that can go wrong will go wrong. So you got this report coming out that Van Wagen is making all the decisions in game, which is unheard of for a general manager to do. Steinbrenner, if Steinbrenner could have done that with Billy Martin in the 1970s, he would have done it. Every freaking time if he could have. He didn't do it. Billy Martin never would have stand for that. And that's why, you know, a few months ago, me and uh, Eric were talking about whether or not Joe Girardi would manage the Mets. And Tressler thought that the main reason uh, why he wouldn't come is because the Mets wouldn't pay his price. And I said the main reason why he wouldn't come is because he is not the type who would stand for being controlled. And I think... This kind of proves it's the control factor is why you're not getting a guy like Joe Girardi here because the Mets need to control everything. And it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if they knew what they were doing when they were controlling this stuff. But it's pretty obvious when you got a guy who's been a player representative his entire career, first year as a general manager, hey, maybe he's not the best guy to be calling all the shots, especially in game. And Mickey Callaway, listen, he gets fired tomorrow. Nobody's shedding a tear for him. I don't necessarily blame him for starting to lose his stuff the way it's going, because if you're being micromanaged like that, yeah, it probably gets you every now and then. It would. And we didn't even talk about the fact that last week, Dave Island um, and the bullpen go, coach go, both get fired. Fine. Get the hell out. No problem there. You replace him. I, I don't even remember his name, but he, uh 82 year old pitching coach. And, you know, it's funny because guys like Greg Giannani and, Bo- and Boomer Siason and a number of Francesa, a number of talk radio personalities were making fun of the Mets for saying we need to do new, fresh ideas. And then they bring in an 82 year old. And a lot of people felt like they were doing ages stuff and all this stuff. No. I'm not trying to be ageist or anything like that. You want to work at age 82, hey, good for you. Go right ahead. You get to make fun of the organization who thinks that this is the best move for the team rather than bringing in a guy who's actually – because let's be honest, all the old ways are being phased out of baseball. So you're going to bring in a guy who's literally been around since the dawn of time rather than someone who is actually – on somewhat of the cutting edge. You've got a uh, pitching strategist, and God only knows what the hell that is, but um, you, you're going to have an 82-year-old pitching coach. Okay, all right, fine. And then you get the press conference yesterday where Callaway needed two attempts to, <laughs> to announce that he apologized to report. He needed two attempts. He couldn't get this right on the first time. Vargas didn't even really do anything. And then last night, they get blown out by the Phillies. And tonight, they actually had the lead at one point. But hey, what a surprise. They just blew that lead. So this season is completely going underwater. This is getting very bad very quickly now because for the last couple of weeks, they've actually been playing legitimate contenders. And again, the lineup is good. They don't have a bad lineup. You look at this lineup, McNeil, Alonzo. We're going to pretend Cano's not in the lineup because Lord knows he shouldn't be in the lineup and he especially shouldn't be batting third for some reason. Conforto. Frazier has actually looked like a major league baseball player, which is something nobody thought he'd be able to do at the beginning of the season. So he's actually held his weight. Dominic Smith. Wilson Ramos. You can say what you want about him behind the plate. He's a good bat. And then Rosario. And everybody made a big deal that they started leaking that they were thinking about moving him to center field. Uh, at some point uh, here. And I got to be honest, to me, 
I'm okay with the idea of trying him out in the center field because you haven't had a legitimate center fielder since Carlos Beltran. I'm okay with that idea. I think the problem with everyone and uh, that everyone has with this and what kind of leads to the, uh, the, to the narrative of the dysfunction, why are you announcing this midseason? This is something that you should be trying out in the spring training when that's the time to experiment before the season starts. February, pitchers and catchers, March, that's when your spring training games come. That's when you want to experiment with stuff. Not in June when you're four or five games under the 500 and just pray to God your season don't end within the next week, which it likely will. But with that, he's made it. He's apparently struggled to get on the air, but he is here. Eric Tressler, how you doing? Good. For some reason, it just wasn't reading the numbers as I was like typing them in, mm. and it would like read it back to me, and then it would be like goodbye, and then it would, and I call again. It was really odd. Well, uh, I'll tell, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this. For some reason, a couple weeks ago, my I was using my laptop audio for the longest time, and now for some reason, the microphone on my laptop does not work. So I had to start using my phone to call into the show. And it did that to me the first time I tried calling it two weeks ago. But I kept, I kept mixing up the numbers. So I know what I was doing on that. I don't really have an explanation for you on that one. But I am happy you are here tonight, my friend. Happy so, to be here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So what I've been talking about and what I'm sure you have an opinion on before you've come on here is I'm talking about the Mets obviously and all the dysfunction that has gone on within the last week from firing Dave Island and the bullpen coach to bringing in the 82 year old pitching coach and uh, the Jeremy Accardo, the former relief pitcher who is now the pitching strategist to them blowing the game on Sunday and Callaway uh, cursing out the reporter and Vargas uh, having to be held back going after the reporter. And then the report that Brody Van Wagenen, is making all the in-game moves uh, to Mickey Calloway. Because, I mean, we all knew Mickey Calloway was a puppet manager anyway, so I don't really think that's a big surprise. And then the fact that Calloway needed two press conferences last night to announce that he apologized to the damn reporter. Them getting blown out last night. They just blew another lead today. Yeah, this season's a fucking mess. And then I look over and you guys, 28th straight game with a home run. Third big best record in baseball. Everything's going right for you guys, as always. So, what, what do you got to say to that? Mets be the Mets, and the Yankees are the Yankees. I, I, it's, it's that simple. It's the way organizations are run. Mm. The Mets organization is a train wreck. It's, it's, it's no, you know what it is. The top down, you, it's no, 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 no. Hang on, hang on. It's not a train wreck. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a callback. It's hot garbage right now. It is. It's trash. <laughs> but the, but the hiring of Brody Van Wagen was hot trash. It was none of it was any good. It was all bad. Mickey Callaway, yeah, like you, you could have done better. You could have, you know. But again, you strive for mediocrity, and that's what you get. You know what I mean? It's well, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna do a little Greg Giannani right here because Mickey Callaway is Mr. Aw shucks to me. Aw shucks, God, G Willikers. <laughs> that's what he sounds like if you listen into his press conferences. You've heard him, right? Very sparingly. I'm too busy watching a good ball club. I'm oh, thank you. That, oh, that's nice. We're getting guys healthy, Stanton, Judge, Gregorius. Well, or, you know, so we're picking up steam. It's uh, it, it's all looking good. I'd, I'd rather ride high going into the All Star break. Uh, um, fine. you know, so I mean, we're uh, we we need to just keep the pressure on, keep winning games, keep winning series. And good things are gonna happen. The Mets, I don't know. They need a. They they need again. It's a revamping with the coach and the GM. You don't have the right people in place. Well, yeah, yeah. start to the top, and that's mm -hmm. just it. And then the talent falls in place. It's, it's you know, you guys just seem to get the worst out of players. Where the Yankees get guys like Cameron Mabin, the career two fifty hitter, and comes to. New York and people are clamoring for him to stay over Gardner now. It's it's crazy. I've heard those calls. Works. The Mets, yeah, and the Met, and yet the Mets. And by the way, we're going to talk about a call in a second. This is so absurd. I'm, but pisses me off that a guy like him could be, be on the goddamn radio. I'll, I'll be honest. It, it, 
it, it annoys me to a, a like no well. Anyway. You want to? You want to go? You want to go? Go it's right ahead. Trey Carden. You know what I'm going to say? I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How can you even dare say that they should trade Judge? Well, wait a, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is in baseball to get oh, Carden. You mean Carlin? If you that, mean yeah, cause whatever. Car- Car- yeah, yeah. Carlin, Carlin, whatever. One of those no, no. Cards. Carden's the Carden's the Carden's the yeah, but Car- you defend the defend the fan. This is. This is your ballpark. You like these guys. I can't well, stand them. Hey, I, hey, let me let me just cl- let me just that's clarify just something. That's just a hot take. That's just a hot yeah. take. That's not. Yeah. That's, there's no truth behind that. There's no actual thought behind that. That's just let me say something to grab headlines and attention, and that 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 to me is 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 garbage. That that yeah. that's hot trash. Well, I want you to explain the whole thing, but I want you I want to also clarify. Craig Carton's the guy who's going to jail. Chris Carlin is the guy who's on afternoons. So you're talking about Carlin. And I agree with you. He says things just to get headlines. I absolutely agree with you on that. But how did this whole thing come about? Because I missed this. They were talking about like trading for guys and whatnot. A couple of days ago they were talking about like what moves can the Yankees make and whatever else. And he was mm-hmm. saying they should trade Judge. And he just, I think that's absolutely absurd. I which I agree with. I mean, you're not going to trade the guy who can be the face of your franchise for the next ten There's years. Under control I, for the next few years before you yeah. even have to pay him. You're going to bring Scherzer in and have to pay him a ridiculous amount of money for a whole bunch of years because of no, no, no. He's only the third he, too. He's only got two years left, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, after but then this he's like half of his contract is deferred. He's owed forty two million dollars next year alone. Yeah, I, 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 you are right on that. But that deferment, no, I, I'm not trying to defend this. By the way, um, the deferment the Nationals would pay. There's no way the Yankees would pick that well, up. No, they would not. I was yeah. reading today, if the Yankees made the trade, they would have to say in there that the Nationals were going to pay that. Oh, that's horrible. Otherwise, oh no, 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 no. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I I absolutely agree with you on that, and that's it makes why no sense. You're going to give up one of the best players in baseball. You get no. I mean, listen, I'm not downplaying Scherzer. He's a phenomenal pitcher, one of the best pitchers in the league. But I, it's not comparable when you're talking about money. Which I agree with. Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you this, Chris Carlin. If he has done nothing else, because I listen to that show occasionally, very rarely, but I do listen to it. He makes Bart Scott sound intelligent. Which I didn't think was possible a year and a half ago. That whole show is trash. Mm. It really is. I'm not a fan of that show. I'll be. Yeah. I just. Yeah. I'll, I'll turn it on every now and then in the afternoon when I get when I get tired of listening to Stephen A. Sometimes his rants I can only you know. He's an yeah, man. He knows what he's talking about, but sometimes for uh, just I got to I got to turn the channel for a few. Minutes. So, no doubt. So, yeah. So, I mean, I just yeah that that whole take you can't you can't even entertain that idea. You want to dangle out Clint Frazier, and I get you. I'm not saying Clint Frazier brings you back a a Max Scherzer. That's not that's an absurd trade too, and I wouldn't even think about it. I wouldn't even think about a, a top five prospect. You know, in the Yankees, if they package up all their prospects and send them out, I don't think it would be enough to get Scherzer. Honestly, what's down there? I think you would have to include a Torres or. You know, and then Duhar plus a Frazier plus a bunch of other things, too. Mm. I think it would take too much to get a Scherzer. I don't think the price tag is worth it. I think he commands that price tag. I just don't think he should pay that price tag. I much prefer to try and trade, like, a, a, if we're going to have to trade Frazier, which I don't want to do, if they come to that conclusion that he could bring the most back because he is the most MLB ready, he showed what he could do already uh, at big league pitching. He, he he can hit. He can flat out hit. His defense isn't great, but you can improve defense. Maybe he brings you back a bone gardener. I don't. I don't even know if I would trade him for a Strowman. Although I, I, I don't know. Well, I like I Strowman. Seen, I, I, I haven't I, seen enough of Strowman. Though. I have him on my fantasy team this year. I picked him up. He's actually been very good this season. He's always had the potential, but he had like one or two uh, subpar seasons, so that kind of killed his stock a little bit. But I'll tell you this. I don't think Scherzer's going to be available now because the Nationals have kind of started to turn their season around. Like the only way they were going to trade Scherzer is if they were completely out of it come July. 31st. I, I don't really think I that's going to happen. I don't think anybody would pay the price tag anyway. Which I agree with. I, 
I think it's the same reason. No, it, like not not saying you guys would think about it, but like if you guys wanted to trade Stan, there's no way that would happen because there's still three hundred million dollars owed to that, and he's got the no trade clause. So it's basically the same thing. I think Bumgarner or Strowman would probably be your best bet if you trade if you are are looking to upgrade. And I think the Bumgarner for Frazier kind of makes the bo- most sense for both teams because because Bumgarner put the Yankees on their on his list of teams he didn't want to be traded to traded to. They'd have to negotiate a new contract before that trade would happen. So you wouldn't just have him just for this season. You would probably get like two or three more years out of it. And as much as the Yankees already said they don't want to trade Frazier for like a one-year guy or anything like that, two, three years from now, you're still not going to have a spot to play Frazier if everything goes well because you're still going to have Stanton and Judge. Um, I mean, the Encarnacion thing is only going to be for this season anyway. But you're still going to have those guys in the corners, and you're probably still going to need a starting pitcher. So I, I would think that one makes the most sense. Where yeah, and if you're looking at it from an age perspective, then Strowman makes the most sense. But what do you say? No, I agree. I uh, don't mm-hmm. have much to add. I mean, I agree with you that Strowman is is better if you're looking to go younger. But you know, if you could get Mad Bum for two or three more years, you're going to get a pretty good pitcher and a guy who mm-hmm. has. You know some of the best postseason experiences of 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 anybody out there. He he's tremendous in the play in the playoffs, and I think he just lives for big moments. I think that oh, yeah. right now when the Giants aren't that good, he's just not that good because he's just not enthusiasm. That hype isn't there. I think the more yeah, he gets yeah. hyped, the better he becomes, and like he doesn't get frazzled. He 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 lives for that moment, and I, that that's why I think he could fit in New York. Because he's going to have a chance at a whole bunch of those moments. So yeah. I think and, that it could work. And if we had to give up a guy like Frazier to get him, I wouldn't want to do it, but I would do it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I thought we need uh, one more pitcher to get us over the head of home. And that's mm. that was going to do it. Like you said, there's no place for him to play in the immediate future. When Hicks just signed a seven-year deal, Stanton isn't going anywhere, and Judge is the face of the franchise. So – uh, you know, you, you, you're not getting any solid playing time. And then they have guys that they can rotate in, you know, like Gardner, if you want to sign him for another year or whatever else. I mean, at best, Frazier would probably be a fourth outfielder for a little while. And I got to mm. be honest, I personally, I think he should be playing over Hicks. I think he should be playing over Gardner. I really like Clint Frazier. I think he's going to be a really good MLB player for a long time. Mm-hmm. So... Well, you know, you know the, you know the problem with that though is that Hicks and Gardner are your only center fielders. Though, if you play Frazier over him, who are you playing in center field? That's the problem, know, right? Maybe, that, maybe yeah. you move Judge over. I don't know. You really think that would work though? No, I mean, but he's, yeah. he's got a cannon and he's got better wheels than people give him credit for. So if you had to, I, I, I you could do it. Hmm. You said you'd have to carry Frazier as your fourth outfielder and, like, you know, probably wouldn't be an all-the-time thing, but... And I don't think that uh, would work for him at all. I don't think... I don't don't either. I'll be honest. That's why I have a hard time seeing an immediate spot for Clint Frazier, and Mm. that's why if if he's the piece we got to give up, I would do it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I want to give a shout out to my my mother. She's in the chat room here. I know, I know, she probably not. Um, I do, and I mean no disrespect here. This is totally in a funny way. I, I know she's she's having a hard time probably keeping up with what we're saying, but I thank her for listening to the show. Uh, so thank you, mom. Love you. Um, you want to go back to basketball a little bit? You got anything else you want to add for baseball? Well, I mean, I thought you'd want to talk about. You know the, the the probably the greatest New York draft in I can't even tell how many years. Well, that uh, if you talk about the NBA and the NHL, yeah, that's where we're going to well, go I'm next. More the NHL with Capo Caco. Yeah, it's and funny because I. Stud. Oh, good, mom. Yo, she kept up on everything. Hey, mom, I'm proud of you. That's awesome. That's great. All right, cool. Um, uh. So here's the thing. When you first mentioned the name Capo Caco to me a few months ago, I really thought that, that there was no way that was a real name. 
<laughs> I never I thought told that. You. Yeah, no, you did. You did. Never. I, but I just hearing it the first he's time. He's really good. He's, he's, he's really good. He's, yeah, really good. I was actually playing. For, I don't know if in the chat room tonight or listening, but I know me and him have been talking a little bit, and he's uh, he actually wanted the Devils to draft Kako. Hmm. He wanted Kako number one. So. Hmm. Um, well, tell not me for about any this. reason that he doesn't think that Hughes. He just thinks that it may take Hughes more, a little more time to get NHL ready, where Kako's yeah. got the size um, to come in and kind of kind of play in the NHL right now. So yeah. that's where you know he's played for the thought that maybe Hughes would be a year or two away developmentally, probably from where Kako may be coming in this season. You know, so that that that's really what it is, and. Uh, he just thought, probably thought that Capo Capo fit a little better with the team that's currently constructed too. So, yeah. um, but to bring those two things, that's, those are the real reasons he wanted them. But he's happy to get Hughes too. They're both great picks. So this is a two-player draft, much like the NBA was a three-player draft. Mm-hmm. This is a two-player draft. Well, I want to I want to ask Capo, and they were above and beyond because these yeah. two names you really heard about prior to the draft. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest. I don't, I don't usually talk NHL draft. Mm-hmm. The, those two guys were so hyped over the last couple of months, and oh, yeah. uh, especially with the Devils and the Rangers. I mean, cause mm-hmm. I'll, I'll be honest. I'm not that I'm a fair weather fan, but I, I I I always root for the Rangers, but I don't hate the Devils. And a lot of people hate it when I say that because they're like bitter rivals, and it's like a Yankee fan and a Boston and a Red I'd, Sox I'll fan. T- I'll tell you, I'll tell you yeah. But um, I'll t- I go ahead. I'm just gonna say it's very rare that I hear a Jersey guy saying that he would root for the Rangers over the Devils. Because I know well, Jersey said, people. I, my dad was old school, and when I grew up in yeah. old school sports, I grew up a Yankee fan, a Knicks fan, a Ranger fan, a Giant fan, like classic New York teams. And that's just the way I came up. But as I grew up, my mom was kind of a Devils fan. So, like, there would no. be times, like, I would get a Ranger hat or I would get, like, a Devils shirt or whatever. And I just mm-hmm. always kind of like both teams. I ended up going to more Devils games because they were continental. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's just easier to get to, and tickets were cheap, and, you know, so I've been to some Devils games, you know, where oh. I have way more Devils games than I've been to Rangers games, but I no doubt. if they play each other, I'm going to root for the Rangers, it's just the mm-hmm. way it is. No but, doubt. Uh, I'm, I'm happy for them, too, getting an outstanding player, a guy who's going to, you know, play at the top level for probably a long time in this league, and... uh yeah, it's an exciting time in New York, and then the next draft to Barrett, but that was that was to be expected. So I don't well, really have any thoughts on that. Well, let's go back to the hockey one because one thing I didn't even know about till I guess yesterday was that the Devils didn't just take the guy at number one; they traded for PK Zubon at some point in the draft. Well, yeah, I don't know if that was right after the draft or right before the draft, but they did. They traded for PK Zubon. Um, the, the Devils are all making some moves. They're trying to win. I think that, you know, Hughes is going to be great. And we already know Subban's a great player. So uh, it, it's a good adif- addition to the Devils lineup. Yeah, no doubt. Um, here's what I want to ask you on the NBA draft. Because you said, and you're not the only one who said this, because I've heard this throughout, three-player draft. But I think we all know that when you look That's back right. at a draft, when you look back at a draft in five years, there's always guys who bust out who you didn't expect to bust out, and then there's guys who were can't miss guys who wind up missing for some way, shape, or form. So if you had to pick a couple guys in this draft who were probably going to bust out who no one would have expected to bust out, you got anybody in mind? I'll be honest, I got nobody in mind. I don't think there's any. Maybe a Cam Reddish at ten because he kind of played behind Zion. And uh, RJ maybe wasn't healthy all year long. He, you know, probably has some development to do too. And he has the potential. Mm-hmm. Um, outside of that, um, I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't think anybody else in this draft is really going to be superstar worthy. Okay. Well, not necessarily superstar, but just guys who will be like solid contributors to teams. Like, uh, what about the guy the Hawks wound up taking at four uh, when they made the trade with the Pelicans? Hunter? I think Hunter. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean defensively, he's going to come in and be, do well, but he needs uh, development on the offensive end of the uh, of uh, things. And I, I just, 
don't see him being a superstar right out the gate. He could be maybe a nice role player, solid rookie coming in, but I just don't see much more out of him than that. You know, maybe in a few years, maybe he gets an all star appearance, maybe something happens, you know, and he he develops, but so I see that development, I'm not gonna put much stock in him. Hmm. <clears throat> what did you think of the Pelicans making that trade with the Hawks to add to their kind of stockpile that they got out of the um the Davis trade because they basically have added six or seven players now as a result of this Davis trade. And I know you called it hot garbage last week and I know there's no superstar, but is there something to be said for the fact that they've added all this young talent to their team right now? And they still got Drew Holiday and they still got a couple other pieces. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't think they're going to be a playoff team per se next season, but to go back to what Dave said last week, they could still be a lot of fun to watch next year. (laughs) <laughs> all right riddle me this batman okay if you if you if you have a pile of steaming hot garbage i don't think it's it a blaze <laughs> and, then, and then you and then you take some new garbage and you throw it on top of the steaming flaming pile of garbage it's just more garbage. But here's the thing. I don't look at the Pelicans as completely steaming garbage, though, because you're not talking about what the they're Knicks have been. They're, they're not a playoff team. They're not a playoff team. They're not a playoff team. The Knicks are dumpster fire. Oh, oh, excuse me. Excuse me. They're not even <laughs> trash on fire. They are a full-on dumpster fire. Oh, excuse me. I do apologize. There is, no, there is no putting that out. It's a five-alarm blaze. I have an absolute mess and a shame, and I, I don't know what they need to do, but somehow beg and plead Kevin Durant to to go crazy in sign room. But uh, outside of that, <laughs> even that doesn't fix it for next year. So I mean, they're just they're they're, they're another team that they're a full on dumpster fire. Well, a pile of trash. They're, they're well, I, ap- I apologize to all trash piles out there for comparing you to the old to the New York Knicks. I apologize, but here here was my initial. Even point. the Lakers turned it around. They were looking like a big old. Well, I fire. somehow they extinguished that. And now they. I don't think that turd. I don't think Davis completely <laughs> polishes the turd, though. If we're going to be honest, well, no, because they're getting there, though. It's, it's not shiny yet. It's not. No, it's, it's not. It's it's not. Well, but, uh, but what it is is that they can find a way to somehow convince, you know, a D'Angelo Russell or somebody else to come back and play. I don't think Russell would Lamar. ever come back to them. I don't think I don't Russell know, would ever really come back. Rumbling to maybe a, you know. Um, reunion tour could could happen and that, you know maybe he, he can uh mend fences there in in la i don't know i've heard the rumor lately so i'm not going to count it out um tyree i i don't see him going to la but you never know there too so that's the I, that's I, that's the one see who they get but they're 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 way less of a dumpster fire now they're, like i said they're, they're they're on their way to polishing the turf no, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> well, here's the thing. I said it last week, and I'm going to stand by it. I think in the end, at the end of the day, I think you are going to see Kyrie go to the uh, to the Lakers. I know they're still trying to get uh, cap space and everything, but I think that one makes the most sense. I think Irving saw what it was like being the number one guy, and he didn't like it. And him and LeBron made up. They made nice and everything. I could definitely see him going back to playing with LeBron and everything and doing the whole thing, uh, going to the Lakers and Kyrie, LeBron, Kuzma, Davis. That's, that's the potential for a great lineup right there. I think Russell, as much as I, I, as much as I stand by my idea that if Russell and a couple other guys went to the Knicks, they'd be good. I think Russell should stay with the Nets. I really do. Because you look at what they turned him into and what he was able to do on Kenny Atkinson. I I mean, honestly, Atkinson is so good with the team ball. It's the same thing with Brad Stevens at the Celtics. They saw what Kyrie did to that team. Why would you want to put him in a scenario where the whole reason why that's for a playoff team last year is because you got all these guys playing as a team. And then you're going to put a guy in there who's all about himself. He's got his own baggage, his own drum. You're going to bring him in 
when you could just bring back the guy who worked out really well for you in D'Angelo Russell and maybe add one or two complimentary pieces to that, why would you do anything other than that? I agree with you. I, mm-hmm. I have no idea why they would go after Irvin, especially after the season that Russell had, the turmoil mm-hmm. that Irvin created. I, I agree with a lot of what you said. It doesn't make a lot of sense for the Nets to do, but I guess they look at it as as much as you want to compare apples to oranges, one or two good seasons out of D'Angelo, people still believe that Kyrie's talent's better and in, in, in the NBA talent wins. And, yeah, but uh, I here's think my... it'll still be a, play- a playoff team with Kyrie too. So they may think their their odds are better. And if they're going to have to pay that kind of money to somebody, maybe they feel like Irvin can put more people, more fans in the stands. Yeah, but there's all, and I'm not disputing any of that because I agree with those points. But here's the thing. Russell is also like three or four years younger than Irving. Russell yeah, is still, you know, it's about, money. but he, it's about, it's about the money, it's but also fanfare, you haven't, seen, you haven't seen Russell at his best yet. You look at what he was when he came to know. the net. Maybe he just had one good year. You gotta give him I more don't, time. I he don't, play at this level. I don't agree with that whatsoever. You look at what Russell was when he came to the Nets, and you look at what he is right now. I think he was only 21 or 22 when he came to the Nets. They coached him up. They gave him some tough love. They, he was sitting in the fourth quarter during big games because they didn't trust him. And then by the end of the season, they were trusting him enough to put him in the fourth quarter. He became a freaking all-star. What you look at that, you look at the potential for growth that he had in those two seasons. He's only 24 years old. There's still more he's got to go. He's not a finished product yet. Irving, you've seen his best. He's not going to be better than what he is. If anything, there's a risk he breaks down even further because you know he can't stay healthy and all that stuff. You're just a, there's a risk that you're only paying for what he's done in the past and not for what he's doing in the future. That's my thing with him. So, you got anything else? Any other uh, well, I, topics? Or uh, well, I mean, there's this rumor coming out that the Rockets are going to try to uh, get the 76ers to do a sign and trade with them for Jimmy Butler. I don't really know if I put a lot of stock into that. You know, I don't wanted think put them over the top either. No. Well, no, I mean, I, I totally agree with you on that one. But you know they wanted Butler since last season because they offered four first-round draft picks for him. But I don't think the 76ers would do that. I think they would look at it and be like, hey, if we got to sign him anyway, we might as well just keep him. So, I don't know. Yeah, do you- I mean, I guess that was their game plan all along, though, if you think, though. From what they said from the jump was that they wanted to trade for Jimmy Butler and try to sign him. They wanted to trade for Tobias Harris and try to sign him. They want to try and sign these guys, so maybe maybe that is their true intention, and I guess we'll find out. No, yeah. fair enough, fair enough. They got a lot of guys they got to sign though, because between Harris and Butler and Reddick, and then you got Simmons coming up for free agency next season. It's going to be very interesting to see if they're going to be able to keep this team together. I still think that core of those five players with Embiid and everything, they they were too young to really get any farther than they got this season. But in a couple of years, you keep that team together, that could be a legitimate force. Reddick's is, uh, staying around. Reddick's going somewhere. Yeah, I think I, I can agree with that. Do you have any – any get more money. No. Mm. I'm good with, the, with basketball. If you got anything else you want to talk about, I mean, the NBA – Well, I, now. there's not much else to go until, until – Well, I, I guess I, we have free agency, but – we got free agency, which uh, I guess we'll have um, the legal tampering period uh, where everybody makes the agreements uh, before everything gets finalized. That will have started by the time we come to air next week. So we'll be able to talk about where some of the free agents start and landing. The Lakers aren't going to be able to get involved in anything until July 6th anyway because that's when the Davis deal gets finalized. So it'll be interesting to see if that holds anything up. But I'll tell you this, because we're probably going to be in it soon anyway. I'll bring this up, because you're more of the guy who was the wrestling fan with me, and I brought up AEW a few weeks ago. And I'm going to bring it up again, because this Saturday, actually, their second pay-per-view type event 
is coming on Saturday night, and it's actually going to be streamed live free on the Bleacher Report website, Fighter Fest. Have you heard any more about AEW since I brought it up last month? I have not. Wow. Okay. Do you, I, I, yeah, no, I've seen, I've, I can't, no, I shouldn't say that. I saw maybe like two or three people post online about or share something about it, but that, that's it. No, nothing crazy. Well, I mean, let me, let me ask you, I know we both used to be wrestling fans. Do you still keep up with it at all? Like in any I mean, sort of capacity? WV, yeah, I mean, I watch WWE for fun here and there. I mean, okay. I don't really pay for the pay-per-views or anything anymore. I'll more turn in, tune into Raw or, mm. or SmackDown. And like, you know, well, I do with Kill Andre, I got the storylines, mm. you know. Well, I'll, I'll tell you the thing you may be interested in. How did you like Dean Ambrose? I mean, I did like him. I liked him as a shield, though. I like I liked that faction. I don't True. necessarily like him split up. Oh, okay. See, I was always, I, as much as I've never really considered myself a wrestling fan since back in the day, more of a follower, I always liked Ambrose. Ambrose was a guy that I thought reminded me of Mick Foley a lot. And I bring up Ambrose because Ambrose was really, like Jericho is in AEW now. Chris Jericho is in AEW now. I don't know if he's going to be on the Fighter Fest show, but the first big um, guy that AEW kind of stole from WWE was Dean Ambrose. He goes by the name John Moxley now, and he's actually going to have his first match for AEW this Saturday at Fighter Fest. He's taking on uh, what's his name, Joey Janela, because you're going to be seeing a lot of the younger guys they got. They got some guys who you know. Some guys you may have heard of as some of the bigger names on like the independent scene, like guys who have done a lot in like Ring of Honor and Japan and things like that. But uh, the bulk of their roster is be made up of, of uh, younger talent. Like I'm going to throw a name out to you. You're not going to know who he is, but you're going to know who his father was. They have a guy by the name of Jungle Boy, and his real name. Oh, I can't remember his first name. Jack Perry. Do you know who his father was? Mm. All right, I'm going to save you the trouble. No. His, his father was Luke Perry. Okay. Yeah. I thought, I, I thought it was going to be like somebody, some wrestler. That's what I was going to think of. I wasn't thinking yeah, of yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, his father was Luke Perry. I did not know that when they first announced he was going to be in AEW, but a few weeks after he died, it kind of came out that that was his father. So, yeah. Uh, I don't really know a lot about him as a wrestler. He's very young. Dude really looks very skinny, but I, I'm sure he's got a lot of talent. Like, um, So there's that. There's a couple other younger guys who haven't – have impressed me in terms of things I've seen for him because I, the way I kind of got into all this is I watched this YouTube series called Being the Elite, which is a combination of a video blog with sketch comedy skits and things like that. And it has like its own theme song with like um, an opening title sequence and everything. And it's uh, it was started as the video blog of the Young Bucks. Do you know who the Young Bucks are? I do not. Are they the golfers? The golfers? Yeah, the young guys. I don't know. The, I know. I don't the, know. Yeah, the young uh, Bucks, are they rappers? I don't, I, don't know. No, I don't know. No, 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 no. The Young Bucks have been like one of the biggest uh, independent tag teams that has never joined WWE for like the last 10 years. They've made their name in like Ring of Honor, New Japan. Uh, different independent wrestling organizations. They have their own merchandise line. You can get some of their stuff at Hot Topic, things like that. They've been one of the most successful independent uh, tag teams that has never joined WWE in history, basically. And they're two of the founders of this AEW. But they made this thing called Being the Elite, which is basically like a weekly TV show. As I said, it's like a video blog with like sketch comedy stuff. It's actually pretty funny at times. And that's where they've kind of introduced a lot of the things that have led to all elite wrestling. But that's where I started watching it, kind of brought me to this. I say it's worth a shot for you to check out. If you, I mean, for it, free, I would check it out. That's okay. it's a, the first, first no, it's for I mean, free. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, 
if I'm not doing anything else on Saturday night, I would check it out. Mm-hmm. Definitely worth it. All right. Well, I tell you what, we got about five minutes left here. Uh, unfortunately, Lisa Hastings is not going to be able to join us tonight, which is a shame. I know he's got a lot going on here. Um, do you have anything else you'd like to bring up, Eric? Um, no, I mean, I, well, for the last few weeks, I've kind of been on the mantra, watch the playoffs, watch the NHL, mm-hmm. watch, you know, as much as you could. But now we're kind of just in the uh, the baseball section of the year. But, you know, yep. football hasn't really started. Training camp's not going to – I don't pay attention until really, you know, mid to late August, you know, for football. And uh, hockey done until October at least. Basketball done till October at least. It's it's that summertime. It's the dog days of summer are coming. A lot of yeah. baseball. I know it's not Dana's favorite talk. There's a lot mm-hmm. of baseball happening. A lot of good baseball too. I mean, I don't know how much you've been watching around the league, but um, you know, some some hot teams, some not teams, and uh, be interesting. I think this trade deadline will be pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean, the fact that there is no waiver deadline, the fact that you can only make trades up to July 31st and you're not going to have that August waiver period, that's going to be interesting to watch, to see that. I don't really like the fact that they're doing that, truthfully. I think if you're going to have one meeting deadline, you just make it August 31st. I think the fact that you're making it July 31st, I mean, a lot can happen between the end of July and the end of August. And I'm going to use the Mets in 2015 as an example because that week leading up to the trading deadline, you thought their season was going to be done, and by the end of August, they were in first place. Now, the Sabbath's thing definitely helped that out, and if that trading deadline wasn't there, they probably would not have made that trade. But it's still a fact of you're making, you're forcing teams to make a decision on the season maybe a month earlier than they should really have to. And you're going you're gonna to have teams that go for it. You're going to have teams that throw in the towel maybe a little early than they would have. What are your thoughts um, on? I disagree. I don't mind them just cutting it off at July 31st. I think you know where your team's standing up by then. Um, yeah, but what about the teams that are only like three or four games out? Now you're putting them in a position where they have to decide their season right there when there's still yeah, two no, months left. I, of- I, I think that's fair. I do. I don't. I, I wasn't always the biggest fan of the the waiver period anyway, and I think July 31st is fine. I really don't have a problem with that. I'll be mm-hmm. honest. What I, what I do want to get your opinion on here, and I know we don't have much time left. I'm give you we have about we have about the whole month derby. I want to give you two names for the home run derby I've heard circa in the last like week or so. One, your guy Pete Alonso. I don't want home runs I, right now. I, I, I don't want him in the home run derby. I remember what happened to David Wright when they put him in the home run derby. Keep him out of the home he run wants derby. It, though. He wants to play. In it. I know. And another guy that wants to play in it but hasn't been asked yet, according to him, is uh, Osha. Um, what's his name? Otani. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I heard. Yeah, 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 he I heard about that. He said that he wanted to play. He would do it if they asked him, and he, nobody's asked him yet. So, I mean, I think that's pretty interesting, too. And I think that would be I think cool. those would be two great names to have in the All-Star game and in the Home Run Derby. So, um, well, uh, Alonzo, El- you would get different, more people. You know how many people from, from overseas would tune in to watch Otani? Oh, yeah, no, I agree. I agree with you on that. And I'll tell you this, so, both of both Alonzo and McNeil should definitely be on the all-star team. They have been the two bright lights of this Mets season. As dark and dreary as it's been, they've been the best parts of the Mets season. So they both belong in the all-star game. You know Alonzo belongs in that home run derby with the season that he's had. I just – something happens to certain players after that home run derby. You've seen it yourself before. But they get in that mindset where everything's got to be in a home run, and then they can't get out of it for, for like a month after that home run derby. And that just worries me because anything that can go wrong with the Mets will go wrong. So that, that's what concerns me about Alonzo being in that home run derby. So, I don't know. Knowing the Mets, though, what will happen is, is they'll hold him out, won't let him participate in it, then he'll slump the whole second half of the season anyway. <laughs> can't argue with you on that one. Definitely can't. All right, man. So that's going to do it for us. Any last words, Eric Tressler? 
No, uh, other than if you're not watching the Yankees right now, you should be. <clears throat> Chapman might blow a save. That was up 4-2. Two. It's 4-3, two on, two out. Two strikes, bottom of the ninth. Or, uh, I'm sorry, top of the ninth. So, right. um, interesting in New York. If you're not watching it, watch it. And uh, until next week, you know, stay sweaty. Yep, stay sweaty, my friend. And that's going to do it for me. I am your host, Mike Aglia Laurel. Mom, thank you for listening. Thank you for everybody thank else you. Thank who you is. Everybody, yep. Mom, thank you. Everybody thank you to everybody else who's listening and who's going to watch us on the replay. I am Mike Aglia Laurel with Eric Tressler and Dave Hastings. Thank you all for listening, and we will see you all next week.